Hi everyone, welcome uh, to this Magnets talk. Welcome from the Magnets team. Um, as usual, the seminar format is 25 minutes presentation followed by about 10 minutes discussion uh, questions. If you don't want to um, raise your hand, you can write in the chat your questions and there's gonna be time for catch up in the end. If you're interested and that is not recorded, but today I'm really happy and excited to uh, present you uh, Deepa Dwyer from Oregon State University. And she's going to talk about paleogeomagnetic field observation from fast accumulating marine sediments obtained from a glacial surveyor fund in the Gulf of Alaska. So please, Deepa, take it over. The floor is yours. All right. So, um... Like Anita mentioned, I will be talking about um, sediments from Gulf of Alaska. Uh, this is a small portion of my work uh, for my PhD project. So a lot of it is still a work in progress. Things are still being uh, explored. Just wanted to share a small portion of it with all of you. And before I get started, I wanted to acknowledge uh, the collaborators that I'm working with that are a part of this project. <clears throat> so my uh, study area in Gulf of Alaska and the sediment cores that I'm working with were collected from an IODP expedition, 341, uh, back in 2013. And from the sites that were drilled from this expedition, my research primarily focuses on site U1419, which is located on the um, on the slope of, of our uh, Gulf of Alaska. And this is at a water depth of approximately 680 meters. And we have site U1418, which is the proximal um, surveyor fan site. And that is approximately at a water depth of uh, 3,600 meters. And the distal site, U1417, at a water depth of approximately 4,200 meters. Also on this map, I've noted in, in the dotted line, the last glacial maximum extent as mapped out um, and determined by Kaufman et al. in 2011. And the shaded regions here um, kind of map out the source material of where we think the sediments may be coming from that are delivered to, to my sites. And that was mapped out by Cowan et al. in 2006. The uh, black lines in the surveyor fan itself are the surveyor channel as it presently stands, but these channels have migrated over time. The uh, beautiful and unique thing about the surveyor fan is that it's it's a last uh, large glacial fan system within Gulf of Alaska, and it helps us by providing a direct perspective of the drivers of the advance and retreat mechanisms of the Northwestern Polarian Ice Sheet. And because we have that perspective, the sediments that are deposited here. Uh, are largely in response to the overflows that are coming through the surveyor channel and would then be insensitive to the changes within the ocean current system that control a lot of the accumulation that we observe in the slope site. And this then also makes sites U1418 and 17 be important end members to understand what is happening oceanographically, but also what's happening geomagnetically. There are very few records uh, available from the North Pacific that we can use to see what's happening uh, to the magnetic field or happening within the magnetic field. And hopefully the records that I'll share today will convince you that these are good records that can we, we can add to our understanding. So here um, I've uh, we're taking a look at the bathymetric profile that's sort of mapped out in the yellow line here. Uh, that's a straight connect between the sites. Uh, so we can visually see just how deep the sites 14, 17, and 18 really are. And the vertical lines uh, over there kind uh, show how deep the, or rather how long the record is. 
I'm not focusing on the entirety of the record. My research really focuses on the last 50,000 years of, of the record. And to bring in to uh, bring the expedition into perspective of the objectives that were part of the expedition, my work really focuses on three main objectives. I'm exploring the sediment records to map the changes uh, within the advance and retreat cycles of the Northwest Cordillera ice sheet. I'm also looking at changes in source and transport mechanisms that deliver the material to these sites and changes in the geomagnetic field uh, as observed by the high resolution records that come out of these sites. Today, I'll largely focus on the geomagnetic field and to better evaluate what these changes look like or how fast these changes are happening, we really need a robust high resolution age model. So to start off the portion of the motivation for, for my study, um, in 2020, Walzak et al. published a high resolution radiocarbon chronology from site U1419 located on the slope. And among the primary results of this study was the discovery and identification of SICU events, which are uh, defined as episodic instabilities of the NCIS or the Northwestern Cordillera and Ice Sheet. And these are uh, observed and recorded as really fast accumulating sediments that contain ice rafted debris which happen to be younger than the Heinrich events in the North Atlantic by approximately 1300 years. This is the age model that was used to make some of these uh, discoveries. And in this age model, the vertical gray bars are the duration of these SICU events. And we can see that during each of these SICU events, we see really fast changes in sediment accumulation. Along with uh, the understanding of the changes in sedimentation rates, uh, Ville et al. in 2021 also published the geomagnetic field record from this site. And through the study, one of the things that we've learned is that the even though the magnetic inclination is faithfully recorded in the slope site, we can't confidently account for changes in declination which limits the site's usability to better understand changes in the geomagnetic field. So for the remainder of the study, I'll really be focusing on sites U1417 and 18. For U1417, I'll be sharing the U-channel records that are measured at one centimeter resolution. And for 1418, we're still waiting to uh, completely measure all of the U-channels that make up roughly 100 meter long record that we'll be taking a look at. Um, so we'll be, I'll be sharing the shipboard paleomagnetic record, which is composed of four different bowls that were uh, compiled together into a stack and resampled at five centimeter resolution. I'll also be sharing the radiocarbon age models that are published as well as uh, new dates that I'm adding to the models and a, a methodology to bring both of these models into the same age depth uh, scale. So for the age models, uh, to kick us off, this is 1417 age model. Uh, in this age model, we get to about 50,000 years in 20 meter long sediment record. These are presently unpublished uh, dates. And even though we have a considerable amount of 25 dates in this record, there are still gaps within the record that increase the uncertainty of how time is progressing within that record. This is the age model published by Ville et al. and Du et al. for 1418, which is also composed of 25 dates. And similarly, there are gaps within, within the record that need to be better filled out. For 1418, I was able to add additional dates. So there are 12 new dates that will be introduced to this age model. In 1418, we get to about 50,000 years at roughly 100 meters. All of the errors that you see here are one sigma in both age and in depth, um, and also one sigma in, in the age models. By 
using these age models, we can also take a look at bin sedimentation rates. So these are binned at 500 years. And a few things to note um, is where we have low confidence or low availability of dates, we obviously have higher uncertainty. At 1417, which is a little over 4,000 meter water depth, we observe high sedimentation rates up to 200 centimeters per year. And at 1418, uh, the highest sedimentation rate is roughly 2,500 centimeters per thousand years. So there's roughly an order of magnitude difference between these two sites when it comes to changes in sedimentation rate. And as we observe in the age models and also in, uh, in the sedimentation rates, there are lots of changes that are occurring um, and how fast the sediments are accumulating. So again, to, to bring both of these age models into a similar record, we're using a technique called geomagnetic network analysis. So this uses a depth to depth alignment of regional records to better constrain uh, the chronology of the individual records and bring them into a singular age depth model. This technique does come with a few caveats. So the region where the records are located needs to be small enough that they experience a similar uh, changes in geomagnetic field through time. And the magnetic field has to be faithfully recorded within the sediments at the time of deposition. There are some uncertainties that we're cognizant of as we put all of this work together. So we are keeping in mind changes in PDRM, changes in lock-in depth that may be occurring. There is depositional heterogeneity, so there are drastic changes in lithology or degrees of bioturbation within the sediments. And as we just saw, there's variable sedimentation rates here as well. And uh, disturbances that may be either a cause of coring or sampling strategies. An example of this work uh, can be uh, seen in Riley et al. 2023 where they've done similar work in the North Atlantic. So going back to Gulf of Alaska, these are presently our records in depth. On the left, we have 1417, and on the right is 1418. Uh, 1417, again, is a U-channel record going up to about 20 meters. And 1418, uh, we're using the shipboard record up to 100 meters. The bottom panel is showing the available U-channel record that we presently have, but we're still waiting for the uh, rest of the record to be done measuring. Uh, on the top is inclination for 1417. This is PCA inclination from 20 to 60 millitesla. And for 1418, it's uh, 20 millitesla, which was measured shipboard. Declinations have been rotated to a mean of zero. And for intensity, I'm uh, taking a look at normalized intensity for NRM measured at 20 middle Tesla, normalized by susceptibility, mostly because of the constraint that we have from shipboard data. The bottom panel is uh, a measure of MAD values from each of these records. For 1417, the MAD values are largely less than two degrees. And for 1418, they're averaging at about two degrees. The horizontal line in uh, the inclination plots are showing the GAD value uh, for the respective locations. So largely the inclination values are sort of hovering around those GAD values. The gray vertical bars in each of these plots are giving us an example of the length of the record that makes up 1000 years. So in high resolution or high sedimentation rates versus low sedimentation rates. And then the purple box over here is an example of a lithological influence on uh, inclination. So this feature is not representative of the change in geomagnetic field, but rather a reflection of how lithology is influencing that particular data. So when we dig into that particular U-channel, this is what the U-channel looks like in CT space. The top panel is the false color image, 
and the bottom panel is the grayscale image. Towards the top of the record, we do see really fine laminations that are horizontal versus the bottom of the record where the laminations become tilted. And it's this tilting of the laminations that's causing the inclination shallowing. So this is an example of how I'm using uh, changes in lithology and also um, advances in, in processing to better constrain some of the uncertainties within the record. And to, to piece all of these uncertainties together, because we have CT scans of individual U channels, we can take a look at all of the parameters that we would want to consider to evaluate how well or how good these records are. So the top panel here shows our CT scans as compared to the HU values, which are derived from the CT scans, uh, as well as shipboard GRAs uh, values. So both of these are synonymous to density. The bottom left panel um, are showing how the shipboard physical properties change within that U channel. Uh, and the center panel are some of the magnetic parameters that I'm taking into or considering for my study. So again, in the top portion of the U channel, inclinations are relatively steady. And once we start getting into the tilted laminations, that's when we start seeing those shallow inclinations. So back to GNA, um, the tie points here are our sort of first degree um, analysis of, or rather comparison of bringing both of these records onto the same age depth model. So on the top left is the uh, NRMK normalized intensity, and I've normalized the values uh, in, uh, so we can better compare the records with each other. Then we have declination with a mean of zero and inclination values. So these tie points are subjective and they are a work in progress. And we are also looking at alternative techniques to test how well we've selected these tie points. So some of those alternative techniques include dynamic time warping. When we straighten those tie points out, uh, this is the record that we end up with. So, um, and I'm currently showing the record on 1418 equivalent depth. So again, on top are inclination. The circles here show where we have dates available within the records. Uh, then we have declination and normalized intensity. Within inclination and declination, we see large degrees of similarities, which kind of fall apart um, sort of when we take a look at normalized intensity. In normalized intensity, we see a lot of mismatches, and these mismatches could largely be a result of the lithological heterogeneity, not only within the record itself, but also across the records. And at a cursory glance, most of the mismatches occur when we have shallowing of inclination or inclinations are mismatched within, uh, within the record. When we translate the depth to depth correlation um, and bring it to our age model, this is the result that we end up with. So now that we've brought all of the ages to the same depth scale, both uh, U14, 17, and 18 now, uh, the age model is made up of a total of 76 dates which means we have three to four dates on average per meter in 1417 and approximately one date per four meters in 1418. Bringing these age models into sedimentation rate um, view that are again binned at uh, 500 years, we still have uh, the difference of an order of magnitude when it comes to changes in sedimentation rate across the sites. And also we're able to better confine the uh, changes in sedimentation rate with the additional of dates uh, to these sites. Also comparing the sort of pre and post uh, GNA results uh, in sedimentation rates space the gold and the blue lines here are what sedimentation rates look like after GNA, and in black is what they looked like before GNA. So in places where we did have good age constraints, we're not observing 
a lot of change in sedimentation rate. However, in places where we did not have as many age constraints, we are able to better refine what those changes look like. It's also astonishing and amazing to see that these changes are coeval across, across the sites, but again, still a difference in order of magnitude. So seeing this uh, similarity in variance does add to the confidence of what we're observing within uh, the geomagnetic field or rather how the geomagnetic field is recorded within these sediments. Bringing all of this back to age, uh, on top we have inclination, declination, and normalized intensity, along with our changes in sedimentation rate. And I've also included which record the date is coming from, just to see how those changes or which records are contributing to, to these changes. We see a lot of similar features uh, of change in 17 and 18 in inclination. So at around 19,000 years, at approximately 27,000 years, um, 31,000 years, and around 39,000 years. Around the time of Le Champ, we do see a low in normalized intensity uh, and similar morphology across both of the records. A really good example of how the paleomagnetic record are observing similar features in, in the change can be observed around 16 to, to 18,000 years. Um, from the site U1419, the time of 17 to 18,000 years is defined as the Q event one. So this is one of the more recent discharges of the Northwestern Polarian Ice Sheet. Um, and we believe that we're able to see a reflection of that in the glacial fan as well. However, unlike in 1419, where we may not be able to use the record for paleomagnetic analysis because of large presence of ice raft of debris, in 1418 and 1417, we see a lot of finely laminated behavior through that interval. In addition to understanding how these changes are occurring within Gulf of Alaska, I'm also interested in comparing these records to some regional records as well as some global models. So an example that I'll share today uh, takes into, uh, uses Panofsky et al's uh, model for GGF SS70. Um, and I'm using this model to because it's one of the more recent models and also because of its utilization of the Pyramid Lake uh, record within the model. Uh, Pyramid Lake is one of the more closer records to Gulf of Alaska that span a similar time frame to the time that I'm exploring. In the next couple of plots, uh, I'll be showing you normalized intensity, inclination, and declination comparisons. And in each of these plots, you'll see the Gulf of Alaska records in the GNA chronology on top, the Pyramid Lake model, uh, sorry, Pyramid Lake record on its independent chronology in the middle, and then uh, the model prediction for Gulf of Alaska using GGF SS70 model. There are a lot of similarities between what we see in Gulf of Alaska and what's observed in the Pyramid Lake model, uh, which was published by Lund et al. 2017. And the, again, a lot of similarities to the model predictions, but there are some differences as well. We do have the intensity low that we observe around Le Champ. And there are also some additional features of interest around between 32 to 34,000 years. Um, but there all are some differences across these records as well. Some of these differences may be attributed to how the chronology was developed for, for these two records. And we do see some temporal offsets in, um, in when these features appear. 
here is the inclination record um, on similar uh, scaled y-axis for better evaluations and comparisons. We have uh, the Lechamp low uh, in inclination observed in the model as well as uh, Pyramid Lake, but we don't see uh, that uh, similar degree of inclination shadowing in the Gulf of Alaska record. The inclinations observed are, are pretty steady in, in all three of these, with the exception of the Lachamp low. And compared to the normalized, oh, sorry, I'm gonna move forward. Um, and then finally, this is the declination uh, record for uh, declination comparison for, for the three records. Yeah, in the model, we do see a shift in declination around the time of Lachamp, uh, which is also observed in Pyramid Lake, as well as in Gulf of Alaska. In Gulf of Alaska, we see a uh, declination shift that post-dates the Lachamp, which may be missing from the Pyramid Lake uh, record, but see, might be present in the model prediction. So this is just an example of how the Gulf of Alaska records compare to the models. Um, I'm also comparing to some of the other models to take a look at similarities and, and dissimilarities within the records. So then to, to close up, um, the, the main takeaways uh, for, for me at least, is that if we can control the ultra high resolution uh, records, then even in high variable or high sedimentation rate uh, environments, such as glacial fans, we can, uh, they can generate exceptional paleomagnetic records. The technique of uh, geomagnetic network analysis helps facilitate stratigraphic alignment and the development of a much higher resolution age model, which is a which is key to better understand changes in uh, variable depositional environments. And the paleogeomagnetic record from Gulf of Alaska are similar to Pyramid Lake uh, and supports, uh, and both of these records support the quality of the, of the other. Uh, and because of that, they can help facilitate uh, age evolutions as we explore the similarities and differences uh, across these records. So again, the, it's it's still a work in progress. There's a lot more that I'm taking a look at. I'm also, uh, in future work involves taking a look at changes in transport mechanisms to the site. Um, I am curious about how Lechamp is manifesting or how the low uh, behavior in the geomagnetic field is manifesting in, in Gulf of Alaska around Lachamp. Um, we can also use these records in conjunction with uh, taking a look at the lithological changes as well as shipboard properties to better assess the quality of, of each of the records where they don't agree with each other. And uh, lastly, the rest of the 14, 18U channels are uh, presently being measured at University of Quebec um, with the work of uh, Guillaume Sinange. And thank you so much for your time. Uh, the project is funded by an NSF grant. And with that, I'll take any questions that you might have or comments or suggestions. Thank you very much, Deepa. Let's uh, give Deepa a big round of applause. Great talk. Um, so now if there are any questions from the audience, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, from what you were showing, this technique GNA looks uh, uh, really interesting and a novel way. I saw Brendan's publication as well. Um, I guess you also plan to apply the same technique uh, for the lower part of the record. Or Eventually, would that yeah. the sedimentation rate be too low? Um, I'm not sure how exactly what the changes in sedimentation rate look like older than 50,000 years, but that is on our on our list of things to do within within our broader group. 
The uh, 1419 record only goes back to 50,000 years, um, and 18 and 17 do go much further back in time. So there, there is an opportunity to better understand those changes. Yes, pl plenty of work with IODP cores. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, so the we, I think there maybe there are some parts that you cannot show, but show, but um, and also time is running up for your PhD. But were you also thinking to do? Some more like magnetic extraction studies on the on the available uh, course. There has been some preliminary work uh, that I was able to do when I visited IRM about two years ago, um, and that's going to be rolled into into one of the chapters. Okay, looking forward. The more to come. <laughs> So no question from, from the audience. Maybe because most of them are from your group, so they already know all about it. <laughs> it's interesting the the part of the like studying the excursions from the sedimentary course, you would expect they are all smoothed out, but actually when you when you work with these records, you can actually see some some of them, but not all of them that are expected, right? From the from the um, from other records, maybe at uh, at the lower latitudes as well. Right, and then it also we also have to consider how the morphology of the field itself is changing at high latitudes, which makes it challenging, I guess, for for these sediments to actually record the larger shifts in inclination. Yes, that makes sense. It also, I would guess, would depend on the ship or data resolution uh, measurements if you couldn't get the U-channels. <laughs> a hundred meters of U-channels is definitely a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, if there are no questions from the audience, I, I think we can give uh, Deep another big round of applause. And Thank you. Best, uh, best of luck for your PhD. Thank you very much. I'm going to just share very quickly few slides. So 3rd of April, we have uh, Katie Bristol, and then we're going to take a break for EGU. And we are looking for speakers for June August slots. And you can find these uh, seminar and past seminars on the YouTube. And uh, looking forward for seeing you next time.